Invoices and purchase orders are just the beginning of the documents you need to recognize and understand in order to work in, manage, or have responsibility for the accounts payable function. I'd love to be able to provide you with a sample of each of these as we talk through them so you would know exactly what to look for. Sadly, each company has their own format and for the most of these, for most of these, so understanding what they are is critical in order for you to understand what to do with each of them because you're not going to be able to recognize them visually or at least in most cases you won't be able to. There are a few standard forms and I'll show them when we get to them but most of them you have to know what you're looking for. Okay let's start off with document type number one. No surprise here invoices. Very simply put an invoice is a bill for goods or services that have already been delivered typically. It can be billed in advance but usually you're billed after the fact. It is issued by the seller and sent to the buyer and it can be sent either electronically or by mail requesting payment and you all you know know this is bills like you get your credit card bill or your uh, electricity bill etc et companies get those types of bills but they also get bills for goods that they order you and i when we order stuff like when we order from amazon for example we, we pay in advance but companies will get the good for the most part we'll get the goods and then we'll have negotiated payment terms and we'll pay for them them at some point afterwards. All right, document type number two, it's the purchase order. This is when a company places an order with uh, another company. They send a purchase order so the seller knows exactly what they want ordered, how many of them, and any other special uh, terms that may be agreed upon. And these are typically today sent electronically. Typically also the purchase order will reflect any special terms and conditions, and it will also reflect the payment terms. Next document type, the third type I want to talk about are receiving documents. Sometimes uh, these are called packing slips um, and these are documents provided by the seller to the buyer and they itemize or describe the materials, the service, or the work product being provided um, under the order or in the container or the, if the box if you will. If you've ever, ever ordered goods you've probably seen them and for example uh, when you order from Amazon typically you'll get a small piece of paper that's put in the box. It's about three inches by three inches unless you ordered a lot of stuff, but usually it's just that little tiny piece of paper and it will document what you ordered and it should match exactly what's in the box. And in fact, if you're receiving uh, dockers that the folks on it work or what do a good job, they will verify that what's on the receiving document is actually what's in the, uh, in the box. Okay, next type, receiving reports. These are uh, summaries typically used by companies and they record the materials received from suppliers during deliveries. Typically, again, these are, are, are prepared, this report is prepared by the receiving document, by the receiver, by the receiving staff, and is shared with the accounts payable department to notify them of received goods. And then this, this receiving report can be used instead of the receiving documents, if you will, when doing a three-way match in order to verify that not only is everything on the invoice correct as far as the amount, the uh, goods, the price, etc., but also that you actually did receive them. Hey guys, I just realized I did not introduce myself. I'm Mary Schaefer, founder of this channel and the AP Now podcast, which now has over 600 episodes. Um, I've also written over 20 business books, most focusing on accounts payable issues, uh, but enough about me. You can come to hear me talk about myself. So the next document, document type number five, if you will, I'd like to talk about our credit memos. These are typically issued by sellers when uh, there is a reason why they owe money back to the purchaser. So it might be because you got a discount because a, a few different branches ordered uh, the same type of widgets and you were entitled to a quantity discount. That's the good news. Um, it might be because you made a duplicate payment. It might be because you had a discussion with them and they um, overcharged you or something was broken and you, you want a refund, whatever. They issue this credit memo and the goal with the, the idea with the credit memo is they send it to you and then you use it as um, a credit uh, on a future payment. So if the credit memo was $10 and you had an invoice for $100, then you'd put that credit, you'd use that credit memo.
memo to pay that invoice and you'd only pay $90. Um, related to that are debit memos, which are sometimes called debit memorandums. These are documents issued by the purchaser requesting a refund if a payment has been made or a credit memo was discussed just, just recently. Not every organization uses them, but if they do, um, this is what they are and you need to be able to recognize them and also recognize the difference between a debit memo and a credit memo because you don't want to get credit twice. Okay, moving on to document type number seven. This is the advanced shipping notice. It's a document that provides detailed information about a pending delivery and the purpose of these advanced shipping notices, which by the way you'll see abbreviated as ASN, is to notify a customer that uh, when shipping is occurred and provide them with physical characteristics about the shipment so the customer can prepare, be ready to accept delivery. And as you might expect, these typically are associated with large items, uh, very common in the automotive industry for example. Uh, if you ever hear a discussion about a four-way match used in accounts payable, the advanced shipping notice is typically the fourth document that they are um, talking about. Okay, the next document type that I want to talk about, document type number eight, I'm trying to get eight fingers up, okay, is the billing notice. Now, a billing notice is te technically not an invoice and you are typically not required to pay it. The best example that I can give you of, bi of legitimate billing notices are those renewal forms that you get for subscriptions, maybe to magazines, to newspapers, to whatever, and, and they'll come and you'll notice that they look a lot like an invoice. And I'm not saying that the sender is trying to trick you into to paying it, but um, it should say renewal notice on, on it. Now, going back to invoices, you may have, when you start looking at a lot of invoices, you'll notice that many of them will have in big letters at the the top the word invoice because they want you to recognize it as an invoice and know that you have to pay it. Renewal notice clearly that it's not the same thing and in fact this is sometimes renewal notices by themselves are legitimate but some criminal enterprises have uh, you know kind of skirting the, the the issue and graying the waters or muddying the waters will send renewal notices that look an awful light but like invoices they won't say invoice on them but sometimes in very tiny letters on the bottom it will say something like uh, this is a renewal notice this is a billing notice you're not required to pay but very small letters um, legitimate companies magazine companies sending renewal notice it's perfectly fine as long as they make it clear that that's what it is and there's no um, obligation to pay um, of course they're hoping that you'll think it's an invoice and automatically pay it but okay enough about that just no no legal obligation to pay a billing notice or a renewal notice unless you decide you want to renew and then absolutely pay it. Okay, document type number nine, if you will. I call that this is the W9, and this is the one standard form. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see we'll have uh, flashed up a copy of it. It's an IRS form that requests the payee, or actually anyone for that matter, to provide a correct taxpayer identification number, referred to as a TIN, T-I-N, taxpayer identification number, to the person who um, is required to file an information return with the IRS. IRS. And the information returns, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, are those infamous 1099. Most companies have one on hand that is filled out and scanned so that they can email it upon request. And most accounts payable departments have a blank one on hand and will automatically send it to new suppliers or suppliers who have changed some, for, some sort of their basic information. Typically, this is what is referred, this is used with what's referred to as U.S. person, i.e. someone who has some sort of a U.S. taxpayer identification number. You should always be using the most recent W-9 and if you don't have it or you're not sure if you have it, go to irs.gov and you can download it. Now I want to talk about its sister, the W-8. Okay, for starters there are several different W-8s um, including the W-8 Ben, B-E-N, the W-8 Ben E, the W-8 ECI, the W8 EXP, and the W8 IMY, to name a few. These are forms that are used by non-US persons and they can be quite complicated. I'm not going to lie to you. In fact, one of them is eight pages long. If you need to request these, you need special instructions on this entire matter. And this in all likelihood will be provided by someone who is an expert in these matters. These are used by non-US persons, okay? 
Okay, the information on the W9 is used for our, our next document type, document type 11, the form 1099. Now, there are many different types of 1099s, but the two most frequently used in the accounts payable space are the 1099 MISC and the 1099 NEC. Business payers will use the form 1099 MISC to report certain types of miscellaneous compensation, such as rent, prizes, awards, healthcare payments, and payments to an attorney. Earning, and they report these to the IRS and to the recipients of these payments. So each 1099, in effect, gets issued twice. Recipients are then required to report those payments as income on their tax returns. Part of why everybody gets so crazed about them, but just part of it. Okay, the next uh, document type that I want to talk about is B notices um, or backup withholding notices, which come in the form of a CP2100 or a CP2100A notice. This is a notice from the IRS that tells you you need to start backup withholding unless a name TIN match is rectified, okay? The IRS explains it this way. A CP2100 or a CP2100A notice to taxpayers, which can be a financial institution, business, or per person who files certain information returns with incorrect taxpayer identification numbers um, to begin backup withholding. There's a lot that goes into the proper handling of these notices, you need a tax reporting expert to help you with that. So I just want you to know what they are so that hopefully you'll recognize them. CP2100, CP2100A. Okay, our next document, type number 13, is what I call a check request form, although we are moving fast into an era where we might call this a payment request form. Now, typically, if you work in accounts payable, uh, you get an invoice and you pay it, but sometimes uh, there is no invoice, the invoice gets lost, somebody needs a special payment, whatever. There's a whole bunch of reasons. And so most companies have what's called a check request form or a payment request form. And what this does is it tells you um, who the payee is. It tells you if you're a check where it's going to be mailed to. It will also, it should have some backup. It should tell you what this is for. And then it should be signed by whoever's making the request. And it should be approved or authorized by someone else, someone who has the authority uh, to do this. Uh, you want to minimize the number of these if you can, you possibly can, because they are more apt to be associated with a duplicate payment or even worse, a fraud uh, because of the lack of documentation that s surrounds it. Could talk for a while about them, and if you want me to do a more in-depth uh, talk on check request forms or payment request forms, just put a comment in the uh, put put a note in the comment field, and we'll take that under advisement, if you will. Okay, next uh, payment type is a remit advice and in the paper world when we issue paper checks that is the stub if you will the check stub and it breaks out what the re remittance is for and uh, people you know like this because it helps the recipient of the funds do their necessary cash application especially if you're paying more than one invoice on with one one check request uh, with one check or if um, you've taken some deductions and you can spell it out what the deductions were for before we get to the last few document types I'd like to request that if you're getting any value from this talk that you hit the thumb thumbs up or like button. It helps us get wider distribution in on our talks, which in turn provides us with the necessary collateral to make more talks like this for you. Document type number 15, vendor statements. Now these are statements sent by the vendor and ideally showing all open activity. Some vendors will automatically send them. Sometimes you'll have to ask for them. When you ask for the statements, make sure that you let them know that you want them to show all open activity not just your outstanding invoices, which some of them will, will do. And your goal when you get these vendor statements is first of all to recognize their vendor statements and not pay them. Um, sometimes they look a lot like an invoice and people are mistaken. But you know, to look through them and see, for example, if there are any open credits that you didn't know about, and if that's the case, then you then you want to take them. So it's generally a recommended best practice that you get a, a one vendor statement from each vendor at least once a year, and then vendors that you have more activity with or that you tend to get more, end up with more vendor credits and you request those more frequently. That's vendor statement. Uh, similar to vendor statements, uh, document type number 16 are bank statements and these are exactly the same type of statement that you get on your own bank.
bank account. It's a statement. They usually come monthly. They almost always come monthly, and they show all activity for the month. So they'll start with the opening balance, show all the money coming in, all the money going out, whether it's a wire transfer, an ACH, or whatever, and then you'll have an ending balance. And those bank statements are typically reconciled and reconciled on a very timely basis because if there is any activity on there that you don't recognize, you need to uh, investigate and try and get any funds back immediately if they were not authorized. Well, document type number 17 and the accounts payable aging report. These uh, reports are summarize a business outstanding bills and invoices by vendor that uh, and due date. Um, this helps companies manage their cash flow and these also become important, more important or less important depending upon what's going on in the organization. But the times where they tend to become more important is at the end of a fiscal period and in times of financial uncertainty. Now, as you've noted, probably noted by now, it's easy to get some of these documents mixed up, which can result in paying something that shouldn't be paid or vice versa. The two most commonly used documents, the invoice and the purchase order, really deserve more a more thorough discussion than we have done on this occasion. And that's why we did a short uh, video describing both in more detail and reviewing how they are alike and how they are different. You can watch it right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck.